The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All-Hit Radio! Welcome to the X-Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the X-Zone, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and it is, let me see, Thursday already, May the 15th. I hope that you had a great day. On tonight's show, Jason Lee will be joining me in a few moments. We're going to be talking about the quest for evidence of UFOs. Our number two, Tom Smith, will be joining me. He is the chairman and director of the uh, the Carla Smith Foundation. Sir Knight Daryl Breeze will be joining me in hour number three. We're going to be talking about the Vatican claims that aliens do not clash with the church doctrine, and I'm not talking about those who, ooh, that kind of cross the border. I'm talking about the ones that cross the sky limits, I guess. And then in hour number four, Cal Korf will be joining me from Prague in the Czech Republic. one 877 Now that is toll free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii at one 877 My email address, xzone at talkstarradio.com. On, uh, you can chat with us at Exxon TV while you're watching and listening to the show from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and our main website, www.xzoneradio.com. Once again, the magic toll free number is 1 528 8255. Jason Lee is our special guest. He is a member of the International Space Science Organization, the UFO Scientific Research Center and American Legion. He has been a UFO paranormal investigator for over 30 years now and worked in broadcast TV, news, and production for almost 20 years as a live cameraman, editor, writer, ENG photographer, and director. His film production company, Workhorse Productions, filmed the famed 1994 Checks, Crooks, and Counterfeits, uh, which was used by training, which was a training film used by the national food store chains, FDIC banks, and law enforcement agencies in training to detect counterfeits and made national media news. It remains the only such commercial training film in the world. And Jason Lee, my good friend, all the way from the great state of Texas, how are you? Oh, I'm doing well, Rob. How are you up there in Hamilton? I'm doing fine, buddy. How's your mom? Uh, well, she's in a nursing home now. She's out of intensive care, mm-hmm. uh, and they are putting her through a regimental of um, exercises and uh, medications, you know, mm-hmm. that sort of thing, uh, to try to get her healthy enough to hopefully come home. Uh, oh, that's and this good. would be her, her second trip, actually, uh, three times in intensive care since Christmas. And uh, the second trip to the nursing home where they rehabilitate for about a month or so. And then hopefully some of the patients get released. Uh, others end up staying there. We certainly uh, hope and pray that she will be re- released and be back with us uh, for as long as the Lord will provide. Thank you well, for asking. Well, our, our hearts and our prayers are with uh, with your mom. And please let her know that her friends in Canada and around the world in the Exxon Nation are praying for her. I certainly will, and she admires you quite a bit, Rob. Oh, uh, really? Oh, yes, definitely. Well, thank, you, thank you very much, my friend. Jason, we've got about a minute before I have to go to my first commercial break of this hour. Uh, okay. Is there a lot of UFO news in the news th- these days? Well, I think, Rob, uh, this will give us something to think about uh, over the next minute or so, and especially during the news and the break. England just announced uh, yesterday their time, today our time, mm-hmm. that they are releasing their X-Files wow. on UFOs and strange phenomenon. Now, I'm not sure when and if they will release all public information, or make all information public, that is to say, 
uh, or if it will all be declassified information. I couldn't find anything out on the Internet about that story other than what I just related to you. All right, buddy, I've got to uh, take my two-minute commercial break. Jason Lee is our special guest. www.jasonlee.org is his website. And Jason and I will be back in two minutes as we continue live and around the world on the Talkstar Radio Network, Exxon TV, and on shortwave right here on the Talkstar Radio Network as I have a beautiful cup of Tim Horton's coffee. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine like hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining room can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you're visiting, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic Felsmere, or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, old Florida cuisine at its best. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Are you interested in the paranormal, ghosts, UFOs, or psychic phenomenon? Join me, Tim Bartley, co-host of Talking to Spirits with Lightworkers Tim and Justina, coming mid-January 2017 to the XZBN. We will channel spirits live and talk to them, revealing all kinds of amazing information. Spiritual attachments will be found and removed on the show, and so much more. To find out when you can listen to Talking to Spirits with Lightworkers Tim and Justina, visit www.xzbn.net for listeners on both sides of the veil. Hi, this is Larry Lawson, host of Paranormal Stakeout, here on the X-Zone Broadcast Network. I would like to invite all of our listeners to the second annual Parunity Conference, January 27th through the 29th in Felsmere, Florida. We have some exciting speakers, including Brian Kano from The Haunted Collector, author Andrea Perrin, whose book inspired the hit movie The Conjuring, and our own Rob McConnell. There are events for the public as well as opportunities for paranormal teams to come together to share information. We also have opportunities for our guests to participate in some investigations of Felsmere's most haunted locations. Check out my website at www.paranormalstakeout.com or www.paranormalfbi.com for times and details. Hope to see you there. Eight seven seven five two eight eight two five five is our toll-free number. Jason Lee is our special guest, and we're talking about UFOs this hour in the Axon. Last night on CTV National News, there was a little uh, a little feature on UFOs, and uh, they're still claiming that UFOs are in the Canadian skies, and uh, there are a number of them that are still unexplained. So it seems that uh, that uh, there is still interest in UFOs. However, the um, 
the main UFO state still seems to be Roswell, New Mexico. Um, one of the reporters was asked about Stevensville, uh, Texas, and Jason, he said, Stevensville, what? Oh, come on. I'm serious. <laughs> My goodness, there were so many credible witnesses uh, to that event, including myself. You know, what I saw in Cleburne, 60-odd miles to the east of Stephenville the same night, which I sent you an email about, by the way, so we have documentation. Uh, The day before, it became uh, at least Stephenville news, and then a few days later, it became national and then world news. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just so many people uh, couldn't be wrong, you know, Rob, about what they saw, and the descriptions were... uh, not so identical that someone like Carl, for instance, uh, and a lot of skeptics would say, well, they they all seem to have different descriptions of something that they claim to be the same object. Mm -hmm. And if you've read about all of the the sighting reports from the various individuals, if you actually put them all together, what you see is people from different points of the compass were seeing basically the same thing, uh, at about the same time, but it's just like anything else. If you see it from a different angle, you're going to have a sure. different perspective. But uh, now, Jason, a couple of weeks ago, there was another uh, sighting of what many claim to be the Phoenix Lights, and uh, yes. someone came forward said, "Hey, I, I did it. It was a hoax, and I suckered all you people in." Right. What does this do for the uh, the uh, you know to the UFO community when you get somebody who goes out of their way to perpetrate a hoax of, of such a caliber for no reason at all? Well, yet another black eye, you know, on mm-hmm. the uh, UFO phenomenon, Rob, and us trying to find out the truth. Yeah. Uh, and it's deplorable uh, for me. Uh, I know several of the major, and I say major, witnesses to the 1997, the March 13th, I believe was the date, of the original Phoenix Lights. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there had been a sighting a year before that. uh, Really? Where, you know, hundreds of people saw uh, almost the identical thing that showed up again in 1997. And these uh, people that I'm in touch with uh, who took pictures, uh, photographs, one is a medical doctor Mm -hmm. and other very credible witnesses such as Mike Fortson, these people just have nothing to gain, you know, from perpetrating a hoax back then. Now, this recent report, I saw one of the videos of uh, what this fella claimed to be uh, some balloons that he floated up, uh, you know, into the air and, and took pictures of and, and perpetrated a hoax. But if you look at the video, Rob, and I would just ask you, how could someone find balloons that he could first of all illuminate and launch them all at, at a specific time at a, a specific formation uh, and have them hover in place for almost an hour if you know anything at all about helium which I know you do and helium balloons they go up you know they don't hover and, and remain stationary well, well they, they did fi- they did find the fishing uh, the nylon fishing cord that he claimed to have used tied to several balloons in his backyard the next day. Yes, and uh, several of these major witnesses that I mentioned uh, from the earlier Phoenix Mm -hmm. Lights, uh, they tell me that the latest reports are, yes, it was a hoax. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I thought, well, you know, you could string together four or five or six or eight balloons, and you could possibly, you know, make a web out of, uh, you know, the, the... thrashing or latching or lashing, if you will, and launch them simultaneously. It is possible. But how do you illuminate them? You know, that's really the trick. You can't uh, stick a candle inside a helium balloon. It'll blow up, (laughs) you know. So there's a a lot of uh, uh, misinformation and a lot of speculation coming out about all of that, which it gets back to the original uh, discussion that we had back in 1997 in Roswell at the 50th uh, Uh, festival, Rob. Uh, I was involved in a think tank, if you will, Mm -hmm. which involved about 12 uh, pretty major researchers uh, in the UFO community. And I bounced around a thought that seemed to raise a lot of eyebrows. And then a few years later, everyone started talking about it. And that is, if there is a cover-up, possibly the UFO and or the ET occupants are part of the cover-up. 
which is to say, if they wanted themselves to be known, okay, mm-hmm. we've heard the saying, well, why don't they land on the White House lawn? Okay. Yeah. Well, they've landed other places. Uh, Socorro, New Mexico, for instance, the policeman from 15, 16 years ago who swore that he saw this craft land and these two little alien guys get out and kind of run around the, the spaceship. And when they saw him, they climbed up this ladder and zoomed away. Now, this is a fully accredited uh, policeman. Uh, he was so ridiculed uh, that I believe he had to leave the police force. You well, know? one would have to ask at, at this point, Jason, and I think this is a valid question, why would an alien craft land in Socorro, New Mexico? Have you ever been there? No. Okay, I've been to Socorro, Mexico, Rob. It is so desolate, you know, you, you would think it, exactly. only cactus could live there. Yeah, well, that, I guess that was my point. Why would visitors from another galaxy... Or universe or, or whatever. Or universe. Why would they waste their time landing in the middle of nowhere land? Uh, that's a good question. Maybe you know they're what? having some sort of engine problems, you know. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and, and I think one of the most interesting questions that I was ever asked was by a teacher uh, when I was doing a, a talk a couple of years ago. She said, Mr. McConnell, when I go away with my family, we go to a destination to stay, to, you know, to to mix in, to... to Take in the sights. Exactly. Why would aliens come all this way just to make a brief appearance and then take off? Yes, especially in Socorro, Mexico, where there's there's nothing but or or, or or anywhere. And and you know another question that I get asked a lot, Jason, is why are there so many alleged sightings of alien craft in Mexico? In Mexico, yes, yeah. a good one, a good one. Uh, the broad daylight uh, video that I had from June the 11th, 1995, as you recall, uh, has been said to be one of the best documented videos of a broad daylight video in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the top five, along with some of the Mexico videos from 1991 and 1992, where you can just see dozens of these uh, objects in the sky that, that which go forward and then make a complete reverse and do maneuvers, which our aircraft just cannot possibly do. Uh, and you, you, I've seen one video that showed almost 35 of these things uh, in, in such an array as to just boggle the mind. You know, mm-hmm. why Mexico? Exactly. You know, why fly over Mexico City? Well, Mexico and Mexico City, they, they have such an ancient history about them. Uh, it's, it's like the UFO that came to town on June the 11th, 1995, here in Cleburne. That was the afternoon, Rob, after a pre-dawn tornado came through. A major tornado took out millions of dollars worth of damage, took out almost the whole south end of Cleburne, and left over seven inches of flood water. Uh, my thought of it was, when someone asked me, I believe you were the one who asked me a long time ago, uh, why do you think they came down that day? And I'm thinking maybe to get a better look at what the result of a tornado is. Could be. Could, Could be. be. I, I, I don't remember that uh, that specific uh, date or question, Jason, but it makes sense. Um, and if you stop to think, Rob, look at all of the, the weather catastrophes we're, we are having oh, you know, recently. Big time. But here's, an, here's another question, Jason. If If the UFOs are going into places of of antiquity, for yes. example, New Mexico. How come there have not been any UFO sightings over Bethlehem or over the Holy Land where the, uh, you know, the beginning of Christianity uh, has its roots? I believe there have been. I don't think there uh, have been any recently that yeah. I've heard about because they had a recent suicide bombing and uh, a rocket you know, launched into a mm-hmm. restaurant, which is, you know, covered yeah, it's their horrible. news. It's horrible. But I, I believe there have been sightings of, you know, what we'd otherwise call nighttime sightings of colored lights in the sky, you know, and that's so hard to define, you know, it really is. And until we get something concrete, something objective, but then again, it gets around to this latest news from Great Britain releasing their X Files. And we, classifying all of this information. Why are they doing that now? Well, maybe because, and, and I think we'll find out in the days and the weeks to come, is that what they what they are releasing has already been on the Internet. 
there you and go. has already been talked about and uh, ging-ganged about, and I, I really don't expect to see anything that is going to be earth-shaking or, sh- or shattering. I, I don't think that, once again, those who are looking for the smoking gun will find what they're looking for here. I really don't think so. Yes, I agree with you completely, Rob. And it's just like Stan Friedman found out once uh, the uh, Freedom of Information Act got passed and he got all of these secret documents. Uh, he found uh, what he thought was a smoking gun, and it was just page after page of blacked-out information. And yet it's supposed to be the Freedom of Information. There shouldn't be any pages blacked out. However, you know, all, in all... Uh in all fairness to Stanton Friedman, those blacked out pieces of paper have made him a small fortune. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Jason, please stand by, my friend. You and I have to take a commercial break. We'll be back after the news. My name is Rob McConnell. Jason Lee is our very special guest. www.jasonlee.org. That's J-A-S-O-N-L-E-I-G-H dot O-R-G. one eight seven seven five two eight eight two five five is my toll-free number. And if you'd like to watch, listen, and chat with us, www.xzonetv.com. The X Zone is a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And we come to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern, right here live and around the world on the Talk Star Radio Network, X Zone TV, and on shortwave from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. is toll-free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii. My name is Rob McConnell, and this is the Exxon on the Talkstar Radio Network, Exxon TV, and on shortwave. This portion of the Exxon is being brought to you by... Answers from your angels with Amethyst Wildfire. Check our website out at www.answersfromyourangels.com. On Monday evening, April the 21st, mysterious lights were seen over Phoenix, Arizona. After eight, hundreds of residents called police and local media to report four bright red lights hovering silently over the city. They changed shape after a while, moving from a triangular to rectangular configuration. Then, one by one, they disappeared. The Air Force had no explanation for the lights. Air traffic controllers said that whatever were causing the lights didn't show up on radar. Theories abounded, with UFOs and aliens, of course, being very popular. One UFO enthusiast named Jeff Woolwine said that he is certain that the lights were from alien spaceships. The lights remained a mystery and became a national story. The case took a twist two days later, however, when a local television station aired a startling confession by an anonymous hoaxer. He had created the UFO lights using road flares tied to helium balloons, launching them in one-minute increments. Some people were amused by the hoax. Others were enraged and many conspiracy-minded UFO buffs were skeptical of such a mundane explanation. 
It's true that just because a person has confessed to a hoax doesn't mean that the case is actually solved. After all, people often falsely confess to things they didn't do, including murder. For example, Jack Mac Carr falsely confessed to killing John Bunny Ramsey in 2006. A confession, especially by an anonymous one, by itself is not credible unless cor- corroborated by physical evidence. In this case, however, the evidence is overwhelming that the Phoenix Lights were indeed a hoax. Let's consider the facts. The formation of the lights is consistent with independently moving objects, no fixed lights of an air, on an aircraft. They rose into the air together, stayed in more or less the same formation while in the same air currents, and then drifted apart as they gained altitude. Also, the mysterious lights drifted towards the east, the same direction as the wind. Let's look at number two. Air traffic controllers reported nothing showed up on their radar. If these lights were, if these lights were the only visible part of a metallic spaceship or airplane, they would have been clearly shown on radar. However, UFOs consisting of small balloons, road flares, and some fl- a fishing line would be invisible to radar. Let's look at number three. The way the lights disappeared also supports the hoax theory. They did not zoom away at high speeds, as one might expect from an aircraft, nor nor did they all suddenly and mysteriously dis- disappear at the same time. Instead, eyewitnesses reported that the lights were visible for between 15 and 30 minutes until they went out one by one. This is exactly the pattern we would expect to see from flares that were lit and launched in a sequence. They go up, remain lit for about 20 minutes, and then the first flare would extinguish. A minute or two later, the second flare would burn out, and so on. Let's look at number four. One of the hoaxer's neighbors, a Mr. Malo, actually saw the hoaxer launch the helium balloons and flares. Malo said the flares were lit at about 8 p.m., just before the UFO lights were first sighted. Thus, the the mysterious Phoenix lights of 2008 are explained. Any objects seen in the sky, especially at night, can be very difficult to identify. And it's no wonder that lights puzzled many people. All that is needed to create a UFO sighting is one person who may not recognize a light or an object in the sky. But, uh, But just because people, even thousands of people, don't know what they are seeing doesn't mean that someone else, maybe a hoaxer, doesn't know exactly what it is. Now, this is not the first time that strange lights have appeared in the dark skies over Phoenix. In 1997, similar lights were reported by hundreds. The military had uh, been dropping flares for over... uh, I'm sorry, the military had been dropping flares over a nearby testing range, though many UFO believers rejected the explanation as part of a military cover-up. The Phoenix lights of 2008 just shows how easy it is to fool the public and create a media stir. All it takes are a few balloons, flares, some spare time, and a mischievous streak. 1-877-528-8255 is toll-free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii. Jason Lee is our special guest. And thus endeth the hoax of 2008 and the Phoenix Lights. Well, Rob, you mentioned something very, very interesting, and if you would allow me, I'd like to submit two very important points. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the road flares. Uh, Okay, I didn't stop to consider that. Uh, I was thinking of the old-time flares, such as the the military uses, which Mm -hmm. are, shall we say, for lack of a better term, flammable, if you will, because they're dropped from, from these little parachutes. Yeah. Uh, Now, back in 1997, the Phoenix Lights, uh, this has been a remarkable uh, misconception by many, many people. When the first set of Phoenix Lights were seen, that was a little after 8 o'clock p.m. their time, the flares that were dropped by the Air Force appeared after 10 o'clock, two hours later. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, uh, getting back to the road flares... Last year, September of 2007, I was coming back from the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona, in my Jeep truck, and the engine blew up 20-odd miles outside of Pecos, Texas, in a remote valley right off of the interstate. 
where this strange fog bank came through where you couldn't see, I couldn't see the tail end of the Jeep. That's how dense this wow. fog was. Uh, I had road flares in my Jeep, and they were the type that you snap and you break with the mm -hmm. incandescent uh, uh, liquid. Okay, you shake them up and then they glow. Okay, now on the label it says they will glow for four to six hours. I set mine out at one o'clock in the morning. The state trooper that passed by at one thirty in the morning, who was going to El Paso, and then he eventually came back and picked me up at about six thirty in the morning. My flares were still glowing when he came by. Now that's almost seven hours later. So road flares going out within 15 to 20 minutes, that's a little hard to believe. Not really, Jason, and I'll, get, and I'll tell you why. Road flares can be different sizes. In law enforcement, we had different size road flares in the trunk of our car. Uh -huh. Some were 15 to 30 minutes. Others were an hour to an hour and a half. So I do know this for a fact that some road flares are designed to burn from anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. Have you seen the ones that last for four to six hours? No, sir. Okay, well, they're, they're very small. I, uh, they were four to a pack. I bought two packs at a mm -hmm. Walmart, if you don't mind me mentioning that name, a uh, superstore, if you will. Uh, and I was told that children nowadays call those uh, something else. They don't call them road flares. They, they call them something else. But mm -hmm. I... Can't, the, the term eludes me right now. Uh, but that's one of the reasons that I bought them was for the duration. Because I'm thinking if I'm going to be broken down at nighttime, I want these things to last more than 15 or 20 minutes, you know. Especially uh, as it turned out, I was in the midst of a fog bank that lasted all the way until dawn. And the state trooper who picked me up, who passed by at 1.30, going the opposite way, heading west, to El Paso, said that he saw those glowing uh, green road flares of mine, and he thought, wow, how awesome. I had two in the front and two in the back, and that's all he saw. He said my truck was invisible. All he saw were the glowing flares, and he was amazed to come back by almost, uh, as I say, seven hours later, and they were still just faintly glowing, but it, had it not been for the flares and the fog, he wouldn't have found me, he said. And I was exactly at mile marker 115 on the Interstate uh, 30, by the way, in Texas, for anyone who wants to jump on a map real quick and check that out. This but is... now the second point I'd like to bring up is the helium. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that, uh, first of all, balloons are porous. So eventually helium will deplete from a balloon, and they'll just become all shriveled, you know, and then just half the size that they were originally as the helium escapes through the porousness of the of the rubber in the balloon. But there are mylar balloons that are not porous, and these are the types of balloons that are now used inside hospitals, inside of areas where helium at one time posed a danger. Uh -huh. if, if you were to buy, let's say, you go to the gift shop of a, of a hospital and you get a balloon a bouquet, that, w that these uh, silvery types right. of balloons are mylar. They do not leak. They're non-porous. Well, actually, the ones I bought for my mother, the next day they were almost depleted. Uh, you know, they just shrunk, all shriveled mm -hmm. up and everything. You got a bad batch. I'd just like to read you something here, Jason. This is from uh, the Arizona Republic going back to uh, 3-1-2007. Pilot debunks that Phoenix lights insists they were flares. On a mild spring-like evening, the string of amber orbs appeared as if by magic a celestial sleight of hand that would, in the coming weeks, make headlines across the nation. Although little more than an atmospheric curiosity at the time, the hovering balls of light soon would become known as the Phoenix Lights, an event that ten years later continues to spark debate over the just what were these lights that night. Now, in the ensuing decade, the Phoenix Lights would change looks, minds, and even a few lives. What hasn't changed in this mystery is that they still hover above March 13, 1997. Now, it's agreed that about 10 p.m. on that date, under a clear sky with no breeze, a string of lights appeared in the southwest sky. 
Officials at David Mon, uh, Monthan Air Base in Tucson, Arizona, would report that no military maneuvers were taking place that night at Barry M. Goldwater Range to the west. Air Force officials uh, would change their story two months later, saying the person on duty that night failed to look at the, the proper logbook. The lights were flares, said the National Guard, dropped during a nighttime exercise at Barry M. Goldwater Range. That's what they were, insists Lieutenant Colonel Ed Jones, who piloted one of the four A-10s in the squadron that says he launched, that says launched the flares. Right. Jones, two, uh, wait a sec, hold later. on here, wait a sec, hold on here. Okay. Jones, in his first interview with the media concerning the night ten years ago, says he can't believe a decision to eject a few leftover flares turned into a UFO furor that continues to this day. He now is Assistant Director of Operations of the 104th Fighter Squadron of the Maryland National Guard. On the way back to Tucson, not from Gila, Gila Bend, Jones says he reminded the pilots to eject their leftover parachute flares. Jones and his crew returned to Maryland. Several weeks later, Jones says all this stuff just blew up. It's nonsense. People, they were flares. I don't know, Rob. Uh, I've seen interviews with some of the airmen mm -hmm. who were on board, who were the actual, uh, shall we say, worker bees, uh, you know, other than the pilots, who released these flares. And they said it was a full two hours after the original lights, the Phoenix lights, uh, had been seen and photographed and videotaped. And he said, hey, look, they do not hover. They fall to the earth. Uh, so how, you know, in the world can we see the, and I've seen these videos that last up to 13 minutes to where these things are completely stationary. And I've seen the, the timer on the video just click by and, and nothing is moving. But then take into consideration the eyewitnesses who saw this gigantic V-shaped object flying over their houses. You see, as the lights eventually went to that uh, canyon, I forget the name of it. Right Jason, there I hate Phoenix. to do this, but you and I have to take a commercial break. We'll be back shortly. Jason Lee is our special guest. Exo Nation, send me an email. Tell me what you think. Or on chat, tell me what you think. V Phoenix Lights, UFOs? Or were they, as the lieutenant colonel said, just part of an Air Force maneuver? one 877 or go to www.exontv.com. My name's Rob McConnell. Jason Lee and I will return on the other side of this break. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Hi, I'm Larry Lawson, host of Paranormal Stakeout. With over 36 years in law enforcement, I have learned a few things. The most important is the proper gathering and preservation of evidence is vital to putting the bad guy behind bars. It's no different in the world of paranormal investigation, whether it's the search for the afterlife, cryptozoology, UFOs, and extraterrestrials. How we gather the evidence, preserve that evidence, and present it to a jury of our peers will make the ultimate difference in proving the existence of worlds and entities that are beyond our imagination. Join me, Larry Lawson, every week on Paranormal Stakeout when, along with my guests, we'll take a journey to prove with indisputable evidence what man has struggled to believe for centuries. Go to xzbn.net for the broadcast schedule and check me out at paranormalstakeout.com. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. 
Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. That's it. Glenn Campbell, he's responsible for the Phoenix Lights. He wanted another hit. He just wanted to get, by the time I get to Phoenix, back on the top 20. Jason Lee is our very special guest www.jasonlee.org that's J-A-S-O-N-L-E-I-G-H dot O-R-G Jason, Jason, another story that our researchers came up with uh, was going back to to, 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 to May 15th Ah, my anniversary I got my honorable discharge from the Navy today and I, uh, the, 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 the years ago well the good uh, congratulations I'd just like to read a little bit of this uh, because we're running very short on time sure he said uh, now uh, this was in uh, which newspaper uh, okay this was from UFO Digest my name is Steve D I am a UFO researcher from Central Florida an article appeared in the Orlando Sentinel on June 27 1999. Uh, the article was by DNA Smith, and it was titled "The UFO, The Phoenix UFO Mystery Solved." It was dealing with details about the March 13, 1997 sighting. Uh, hundreds of uh, Arizonians reportedly seen what was possibly witnessed by thousands of people. Uh, the article goes on to say, "So, what did these people see? Did they see an actual alien spacecraft?" Based on the published reports in USA Today and CNN, plus my own research, I'd have to say no. What the people of uh, Paulden, Phoenix, Temp, and other cities witnessed was not a UFO, but an experimental military aircraft, per- perhaps making an emergency landing. Oh, wait, wait, a, wait a sec here, Jason. No, wait a sec here. Wait a sec what here. has this guy been smoking? <laughs> Me? Why is it when people come up with logical explanations for for UFOs, they they have to be smoking stuff. And I think that this is where... Well, people... because he doesn't give his last name, for one thing, Rob. I mean, you know, Charles D. I mean, who could that be, you know? They always wonder about that, that. Why don't they give their last name? That is his last name, D-E-E. Oh, I'm sorry. I D. thought it was D, like D, period. No, no, Beg no, your no, pardon. no, no, no. You know, he, he bring, you know, the article is extensive. He brings a lot of good points to the table, you know. Emergency here, landing over a populated area with just, almost a million people? Just just a minute, Jason. Just okay. a minute. <laughs> okay. You know, the first clue is the shape. All witnesses agreed that they saw something big and boomerang. That's right. Okay, the beat. The beat. The people. You know what, Jason? People have a hard time discerning uh, discerning the, the size of things in the middle of the night. So you know, I, I, let's just let's just put that aside. Okay. The B two is a classic flying wing design, which looks very much like a huge boomerang when seen from above or on the ground. The second major clue is the craft's path flight. Hundreds of people. Uh, hundreds of people through through the central and southwestern central Arizona followed the path of the craft until it disappeared near Tucson. That's because it it no doubt landed at Montman Air Force Base, which is which sits right next door to Tucson. But uh, why did over 800 people say that it didn't make a single sound? You know, a B-1 bomber, you got to put your fingers in your ears. These things are so loud, even at 5,000 feet. 